from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, folks. My name is Norman Middleton. I'm one of the concert producers here at the Library of Congress. I'd like to welcome you all uh, to HALT, or I'll play Vivaldi. Another in our Music and the Brain discussions, sponsored by the Music Division and the Science and Technology Division here at the Library, and the entire series is underwritten by a grant from the Dana Foundation. Before we begin, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first, please turn off your cell phones and pagers. Put them on vibrate, please. Second, our next Music in the Brain presentation will be on March 27th, when cognitive psychologist Michael Kubovi and composer Judith Shatton, both of the University of Virginia, will discuss the mind of the artist and how composers embody extra musical elements in their compositions. And now I'd like to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Jacqueline Helfgott is professor and chair of the Criminal Justice Department at Seattle University. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology and Society and Justice from the University of Washington and a master's and PhD in administration of justice with a graduate minor in psychology from Penn State University. Her research interests include criminal behavior, psychopathy, institutional and community corrections, victim impact in criminal justice decision making, restorative justice, and copycat crime. Dr. Helfgott's work has been published in several criminal justice periodicals, including the Journal of Forensic Psychology Practice, Criminal Justice and Behavior, Research and Political Sociology, the Journal of Contemporary Criminal Justice, the International Review of Victimology, the International Criminal Justice Review, and the Crime Victims Report. Dr. Helfcott serves on the Board of Directors for Interaction Transition, which is an ex-offender transition house in Seattle's central area, and on the advisory board for the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services Special Commitment Center at McNeil Island. She is the author of Criminal Behavior, Theories, Typologies, and Criminal Justice, and is currently working on a book titled No Remorse, Psychopathy and Criminal Justice with Sage Publications. So the way the discussion will go tonight is I'll first provide some background information and some examples of music and crime, and then Dr. Helfcott will then explain the science and criminology behind it uh, with her PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll end the discussion with Q&A. So the first question is, why is HALT, or I'll play Vivaldi, part of the Music and the Brain series? Well, first we have to consider several issues. What is music? For what purpose is music? Why do we listen to the radio, our stereos, and our iPods? Why are we even here tonight? Music exists not only to communicate, but to also encourage emotional and physical responses in human beings, as well as to assuage the spirits. And the art form is employed in scientific ways, such as music therapy, and sociological ways as well, including elevator music, or Muzak, and, of course, music and crime. In 1697, William Congreve wrote, Music has charms to soothe a savage breast, to soften rocks, or to bend a knotted oak. Who knew that Congreve's phrase, commonly misquoted as music hath charms to soothe the savage beast, would maintain its pertinency over the centuries, even before Congreve wrote it? Who, we, know that the biblical we know about the biblical story of how David played his lyre for King Saul when the monarch was in bad spirits. Some of you may know the story of the Castrato Farinelli performing the same duty for Philip V, King of Spain, who suffered from severe depression. 
In addition, we have the sirens of Greek mythology who lured sailors to their deaths with song. Those of you who have gone through Penn Station in New York City may have noticed that they mostly play so-called early music on their sound system, and Union Station here in DC uh, has a similar technique. And I have been in one airport that not only has soft mood lighting, but also incorporates the sounds of wind chimes, babbling brooks, and other soothing sound effects to keep travelers' stress levels down. But the science of background music is a huge one, and it is a lecture in itself, so we'll skip that for now and get back to William Congreve. If one reads the rest of the Savage Breast blurb, it continues, I've read that things inanimate have moved and, as with living souls, have been informed by magic numbers and persuasive sound. But could music also make humans that have not moved vacate the premises? Could gaggles of living souls be persuaded to act a certain way because of persuasive sound? The answer is yes. In 1989, for, former Panamanian direct, uh, dictator Manuel Noriega was holed up in the Vatican Embassy in Panama City. In order to get him to surrender, U.S. forces decided to blast the embassy with loud music, loud rock music. According to the office of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the purpose of this blasting was to prevent the use of parabolic microphones to eavesdrop on negotiations taking place within the embassy, not just to drive Noriega out. But you have to assume that blasting rock music day and night had to have driven him crazy, just like it would any of us. And all, although the Vatican wanted to get rid of Noriega as much as everybody else, it nevertheless complained to, uh, about the noise to President George H.W. Bush and the U.S. troops were ordered to stop. After all, it wasn't like the embassy was in the middle of nowhere, it was in the city. Eventually, Noriega gave up the ghost and surrendered on January 3rd, 1990. You all may have heard about the repeated playing of Christina Aguilera CDs at Gitmo to punish Mohammed al Qatani, the so-called 20th hijacker. And speaking of loud music, just last July in Urbana, Ohio, Andrew Vactor was cited for disturbing the peace. After constantly riding around town blasting rap music from his car, the Urbana powers that be had enough and hauled Vactor before a Champaign County Municipal Court Judge Susan Fornoff Lippincott. Andrew Vactor was facing a $150 fine for playing his rap music too loud. <coughs> Excuse me. But Judge Fornoff Lippincott told Vactor that his fines would be reduced to a mere $35 if he spent 20 hours listening to Bach, Beethoven, and Chopin. 20 hours, mm-mm. The 20-year-old Vactor lasted 15 minutes before he cried uncle. It wasn't the music, Vactor said. He just needed to be at back basketball practice with the rest of the Urbana University basketball team. George, uh, Judge Fornoff Lippincott said that the idea was to force Vactor to listen to something he might uh, not prefer, just as other people had no choice but to listen to his loud rap music. So a few years ago, I read an article on how classical music was also being used by law enforcement to repel drug dealers from certain hot spots in the city. This specific case on which the article focused took place in West Palm Beach, Florida. Intrigued, you know me, I called the police and asked, uh, spoke with a detective down there who informed me that indeed they had used this technique and it had worked. Another detective on the West Palm Beach force, Dina Kimberlin, gave specifics in another article. She said that the police initially closed a bar in an area that was infested with drug dealers and that they subsequently began blasting classical music from the bar's roof. Detective Kimberlin said the officers were amazed when at 10 o'clock at night there was not a soul on the corner. We talked to people on the street and they said, we don't like that type of music. The West Palm Beach police force said that it originally had heard of this practice at a law enforcement seminar 
Since then, I have read of several law enforcement and security entities around the world that have used this same technique for quelling crime, including Tacoma, Washington, which is Dr. Helfscott's uh, territory. In 2005, London authorities reported that robberies were down 33%, assaults on Metro staff were down 25%, and vandalism of trains and other Metro property was down 37%. So the Londoners decided to expand, expand the playing of Mozart, Vivaldi, Handel, and Pavarotti from three subway stations to 35. Taking their cue from London, the powers that be in Rockdale, New South Wales, a suburb of Sydney, Australia, began piping in Barry Manilow into certain parking lots around town where young people hung out revving their engines at all hours. Did it work? Yep, although at first, the kids in a musical game of chicken decided to rev up the sound systems in their cars to outshine Barry. No soap. No amount of rap, heavy metal rock, or any type of music the kids had in their oral arsenals could stand up to Mandy and one moment in time. <laughs> The kids had enough, and one by one, they left the premises never to return. You all may have even seen the snippet on CNN recently where they discussed using Barry Manilow's songs to get rid of mall rats, as they call them, in Christchurch, New Zealand. So the issue becomes a chicken and egg situation. Are young people simply reacting to what the music sounds like, no matter its genre, or are they reacting neg negatively because these musics are not considered cool no matter what they sound like? And this leads us into the issue of music and personal identity. Because we're, first, because we're focusing on classical music, it helps to think about how classical music is thought of both historically and currently in European-based societies. And we're focusing on instrumental classical music, not opera, which is a separate issue. The notion of the general public going to a concert hall to hear pieces of classical music like you're doing tonight didn't come about until the latter part of the 18th century, although there were early exceptions like J.S. Bach's Collegium Musicum. In addition, the idea that this music is the highest, most noble of art forms developed over the 19th century to become the coat and tied, tuxedoed, sedate, no talking, hands folded, no cell phones environment that we all know. As for personal identity, many young people and people of color still view classical music as white people's music, music for old people, and music for the upper class. And the type of music used in these situations is soft Baroque music and Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven chamber music. So as you guys might imagine, to a bunch of urban testosterone-laden gangbangers, hearing Bach's Brandenburg Concerto No. 4 or a Mozart piano trio sprinkling down upon them on a dark street corner at 10 p.m. like some kind of sarcastic manna from hell would not go over too lightly. Some of you may have realized already that this technique is controversial and not just in classical music circles. As I mentioned before, the city council in Rockdale, Australia, decided to officially decree their Manilow effect after abandoning the use of the mosquito to do the same thing. Uh, have you all heard of the mosquito? Uh, a high-pitched sound similar to that produced by a dog whistle. The mosquito has been used to get rid of young people congregating in places where they are not wanted. This device works because as, as one gets older, the ability to hear this uh, extremely high-pitched sound decreases. So the mosquito becomes harmless to older people because they simply can't hear it. But using this sound in this way is potentially litigious as one is messing with one's ear apparatus. And plus, in this case, the young people simply started using the mosquito as a ringtone. So Rockdale, <laughs> Rockdale decided to squash the mosquito in favor of Barry Manilow, Rosemary Clooney, Frank Sinatra, and others to repel these hooligans. But guess what? 
Barry Manilow, when he heard about this, Barry was not amused. <laughs> no, mm -mm. Barry wrote to Rockdale and told them that if you played any music long enough, it would drive people crazy. And who knows, the kids might have learned to like Barry Manilow's music. Then what would Rockdale have done? So on that note, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Helfcott, who will uh, explain the criminology and science behind this technique of uh, using classical music and other kinds of music to quell crime. Um, hello. Um, um, for, I'd just like to start by um, thanking Norman and the Library Congress and the Dana Foundation for having me. Um, and uh, this has been an amazing uh, series, and I'm very um, happy and feel fortunate to be a part of it. There's a lot of great scholars that have been uh, speaking at these uh, talks, so thank you. Um, I was also very excited to be invited because I'm, um, I teach a summer course called Murder Movies and Copycat Crime, um, and I'm very interested in copycat crime and the intersection of pop culture and criminal behavior, and I think that um, we all have a media, media understanding of, of crime and media and pop culture and aesthetic and style um, ha has a lot more to do with crime and how we respond to crime in society that, than we all think about. So um, um, uh, uh, this topic of music and, and crime I think uh, is, is, is more important than uh, uh, we all might uh, think at, at first glance. So. Um, what I would like to do is uh, put the discussion in the context of criminological theory, and uh, I've, I've, uh, the handouts that you have, uh, I probably won't have time to go into detail on all the slides. I'm, any of you who want to email me, I'm happy to send you the slides if you want the actual PowerPoint uh, presentation. I also passed around a reference list because the discussion of music and crime and the whole area of music and crime um, it, it's not a specific area in criminological theory uh, and has to really be situated within the context of uh, a lot of different uh, works. So I've uh, identified some of the major research articles and uh, books that I'm going to be talking about to um, pull together to make sense of this use of classical music as a, a crime prevention uh, technique. Um, some of the images I have up on the screen, by the way, if any of you are not familiar, I've um, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the association of music and uh, aesthetic and style and subcultural identity. So um, if some of you aren't familiar with some of the images, uh, uh, Marilyn Manson has been, was, of course, associated with uh, Col Columbine and uh, some of the rap and heavy metal music uh, in terms of some of the images on the, the screen. Um, that have been associated with antisocial behavior, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, let me just give you an overview of what I plan to, to talk about. Uh, I will talk about the use of music as a crime prevention technique and strategy, a um, little bit about how that's situated in criminological theory. Uh, talk also, Norman was touching on some of this, the relationship between music and style and subcultural identity. Norman talked a little bit about personal identity and, um, and then how that's wrapped up with the, um, or uh, uh, how that is relevant to the use of, of classical music in crime prevention. And then some of the ethical issues and also methodological issues in studying the effects of using classical music to deter crime. Um, in terms of, uh, making sense of you know, why would uh, law enforcement or community want to use classical music as one of their crime prevention strategies. There's three things I think to, to keep in mind in, in, in terms of understanding uh, the use of classical music as a crime prevention tool. And one is um, the relationship between, and, and this by the way is the um, um, least important of the three, but one is the um, relationship between music and human behavior and human physiology. So in other words, uh, how does, does, does music increase or decrease the likelihood of, of, of aggression and antisocial and criminal behavior? So that's one area of research that we need to make sense of. The other is um, music and subcultural identity. What's the relationship between um, you know, uh, music and the style and aesthetics of certain subcultural 
groups. So why do gang members like um, rap and hip hop? Why do um, you know uh, 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 certain people who um, you know punk rockers and skinheads? And uh, I shouldn't equate. Some people would be upset if I equated punk rockers with skinheads and Aryan Brotherhood. But why why do skinheads and Aryan Brotherhood? You know how how does uh, do bands like Screwdriver and um, Slayer, you know, how, how, how do bands like that make their way into the aesthetic and subculture of, of those types of groups? Um, and the, the third is the criminalization of music and, and pop culture. The types of music and society that we decide to uh, criminalize play a role in the decision-making processes of the uh, people involved in certain types of uh, antisocial behaviors. So when Norman says that you know, certain individuals don't want to stand on street corners and listen to Barry Manilow, and Barry Manilow's not happy about that, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's less about Barry Manilow music, and it's more about the types of music in society we've uh, decided to criminalize or associate with certain types of, of uh, groups. And that, I would argue, is the most important um, component of, of this and the, the uh, most important part of understanding the rationale behind using uh, music as a crime prevention uh, technique. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, dominant criminological theory um, uh, uh, within which this, this whole idea of using classical music to deter crime is situated, and that is uh, routine activity theory. Um, which routine activity theory comes out of the work of Marcus Felsen, who wrote the book Crime in Everyday Life. And uh, Felsen uh, 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 explains crime in terms of um, it being a routine activity. Crime is not an aberration. Crime is not abnormal. Crime is normal. And all we need to do to, to change crime uh, or deter crime, to deter crime is to change the composition of the environment. And so, um, and I won't go into to, to details on the elements of uh, uh, routine activity theory, except to say that the main uh, principle behind routine activity theory is that if you uh, uh, increase the control, controls and decrease temptations, you'll reduce crime. And so there's a lot of different things that we can do within an environment in, or, in terms of changing the composition of that environment uh, to reduce crime. When we talk about using music to reduce crime, we're talking about, and I've, I've talked to law enforcement officers about this who've uh, used uh, crime prevention uh, strategies, and the main strategy is crime prevention through environmental design, otherwise known as SEPTAD, which is an example of the implementation of routine activity theory. And music is used uh, like a spoke on a wheel in conjunction with a lot of other different crime prevention strategies in order to change the nature and composition of an environment in order to decrease the likelihood that certain types of crimes will occur. Oops, that's doing this again. Sorry. So I just mentioned environmental and situational crime prevention. Um, uh, situational crime prevention pertains to changing situational aspects of the environment. Environmental crime prevention uh, pertains to changing the actual, you know, the, the way um, uh, communities are, are built. And, uh, for example, the whole city of Vancouver in Canada is, uh, base, is built based on environmental crime prevention um, uh, in terms of the architecture of that uh, community. So whole communities can be um, built that way. But, um, but, uh, and then the other term I just referred to is crime prevention through environmental design, which incorporates situational environmental crime prevention. Um, and I won't go into too much detail, but that's the criminological theory uh, within which this is situated. Another thing to think about in terms of the use of classical music to deter crime is this, the relationship between music and aesthetic. And so uh, a lot of this is about, you know, based on the, the idea that if we, that, that there's a relationship between uh, high aesthetic and low perception of crime risk. So if you have communities um, that, that are, are made nicer, whether by paint and, and lighting and the use of music, that people will have a lower perception of crime risk. So when classical music is played at a transit station or a bus stop or a subway station, the idea is that that music will increase the aesthetic in that, that community. 
Um, the other thing to think about is the, the idea of um, music as a territorial marker. Um, so in other words, if you are playing classical music in a particular area and the hope is that the gang members in that area will move down the street, then you're basically saying, you know, we're, we're going to um, uh, beautify this area and part of the beautification of this area is to play the classical music and this is our territory. Uh, and, and you need to move down the street. And uh, so uh, uh, a big part of this is the, the use of music as a territorial marker. Now, and this didn't show up on your PowerPoint, so this is why if you want me to email this, uh, I, I, I can, but there's a, a number of different techniques that have been used um, in the crime prevention through environmental design to create boundaries uh, and to, to de decrease crime through the use of, of uh, boundaries. And uh, for example, lifting building entrances to, to make the building uh, uh, seem to be distant or, or, or off limits to people walking by. Um, increased lighting, cutting back trees. There's, there's a lot of different septed uh, techniques, and music is just one uh, small part of those different uh, techniques. Um, uh, Norman already mentioned a number of different examples, but here are just a few more examples. The music has been used as a crime prevention technique around the world for many, many years, so it's not a new uh, development. So, um, and in, in some communities, it's really, uh, you've got the residents coming up with ideas. I just the other day spoke to an a, a officer in the um, uh, Seattle-Tacoma area who said that in his community, the residents decided they wanted to play country music uh, to deter gang members from their neighborhood. And he said it worked. It moved them a block away. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and that came from, and I asked the officer, I said, well, did they know the science behind it? Did they know about crime prevention through environmental design? Where did they get the idea that country music? And he said, I don't know. They just got the idea that the gang members wouldn't like country music. And, and that was the same um, neighborhood where the um, citizens in that neighborhood decided that they were going to set up a card table and play pinnacle. On, on the, the, there were senior citizens in the neighborhood and they decided that that's what they were going to do to try to... So in some communities it's really a grassroots effort. Again, getting back to that issue of you know people are really tuned in to, to some of this stuff, the, the relationship between uh, pop culture and its effects on uh, criminal behavior. Um, I want to talk a little bit about just some of the, and, and not spend too much time on it, but the, the research on, you know, does uh, this work? Does it work to, uh, uh, if, if, if you play classical music, are you going to deter crime? And um, in, in terms of, I don't, you won't find, in fact, I haven't seen any empirical studies specifically focusing on the use of classical music. They could be out there, but I haven't seen um, them. And uh, there's anecdotal accounts. There's uh, law enforcement officers who will say, yes, this works. I spoke to a commander in, uh, uh, in, in my area, a police commander, asking him if it uh, had worked in, uh, uh, in my area. And he said, well, we played it outside McDonald's for a while, and it didn't really work. But what really worked is that when we, we kept the loudspeaker up there and we said, Please leave the area. You know, we just <laughs> and and that worked. <laughs> that worked better than the classical music. And so, um, you know, the studies on septed te septed techniques have shown that yes, crime prevention through environmental design is effective if many different techniques are employed. Um, how effective classical music, Barry Manilow, opera, some of the uh, country western, uh, how effective the different types of music are um, is, is an empirical question that we need to answer that we haven't had specific studies on yet. Um, so. Uh, uh, so the, so the techniques are effective. How effective music uh, is, we're not uh, yet sure. Um, if you're interested to know just some of the early origins of environmental and situational crime prevention, Some of the classic works that uh, those uh, methods are, are based on. 
Um, I also wanted to, to talk for a minute about another principle behind uh, routine activity theory, and that's what's known as the potato chip principle, or the principle of limited rationality. And so this uh, basically says that, and back to that whole idea is cr uh, that crime is normal, everybody ca is, has the potential to engage in, in criminal behavior. Uh, if you change the composition of the environment, you'll make crime more or less tempting. And so back to the whole issue of using music and some of these other strategies. Um, if we have classical music there, it's going to create this uncool environment, and it's just going to be a, a little piece of the, in terms of altering the composition of the environment, that will make a person less likely to eat more of those potato chips and engage in uh, criminal behavior. Uh, another principle that's associated with situational environmental uh, crime prevention is called the Crozon Mixing Principle. Uh, which is what I referred to before with the pinnacle games, that, that if you uh, mix safe activities in unsafe locations, then you'll alter the composition of the environment and decrease the likelihood uh, of, of crime occurring. So you're changing the composition of the types of individuals in the environment, and music has a potential to, to further that along as, as well. Uh, uh, I'm going to skip over. How are we doing on... Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, other elements of uh, crime prevention through environmental design is the idea that, that uh, we need to make it, make spaces um, not okay for crime to occur. So when we talk about music again and increasing the aesthetic in a particular uh, community, it, it's all about again changing the types of people that are going to be in that community mixing safe activities in unsafe locations and, and changing the goings on in a particular environment to make crime less likely to occur or uh, antisocial behavior less desirable for people to engage in in, in that, that community. Um, some additional principles of um, crime prevention through environmental design uh, to control the natural access um, provide natural surveillance and uh, to foster territorial behavior. The, those principles, uh, much of what I've, I've mentioned already, touch on some of those basic principles of uh, designing crime out of, of communities. The other important component of this, so that's, that's how uh, the use of music in, crime, in, in deterring crime is situated within criminological theory, and routine activity theory is a dominant theory in, in cr criminology, and the whole idea that crime is normal and we can change the environment to, to reduce crime. But another component of this comes from the work of Jeff Farrell. He's, he's wrote a book called Cultural Criminology, and he just came out with a recent uh, 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 edition of that, which is on your reference list and and, and, and what he talks about again is the relationship between pop culture and criminal behavior and in order to make sense of why gang members would leave an area where classical music is played, we really have to have an understanding of that relationship between music and personal identity and subcultural identity and the style and aesthetic of subcultural groups and you know, we, we do know that that, that that certain groups have a preference for certain types of music. There have been uh, studies that show that um, gang members do have a preference for, um, uh, and, and black youth culture, there is a preference for, for rap music, um, that uh, uh, white youth culture, certain subcultures are, have a preference for heavy metal music or industrial metal music. Um, that uh, uh, I've mentioned before, uh, Aryan Brotherhood skinhead uh, groups have a preference for certain forms of uh, punk, punk music uh, and heavy metal music. So uh, this use of music as a crime prevention tool uh, really ties into the belief that certain types of music are associated in terms of the aesthetic and style uh, associated with certain types of subcultural groups that are prone to engage in certain types of antisocial and criminal behavior. The other thing to think about and, and, and is that um, 
is a relationship between hypermasculinity and the uh, subcultural context for, for violence. Some of the studies, I, I mentioned before that there is a small component in terms of the relationship between music and aggression or music and human behavior. And there have been some studies, and I've cited them on your reference list, that have shown a, a, a moderate to high relationship between uh, listening to heavy metal or really heavy music and aggressive behavior. But uh, once gender is controlled for, that, that relationship uh, doesn't exist anymore. So in other words, it's the maleness factor that, and the association between hypermasculinity and certain types of, of music uh, that are explaining that relationship between music and the aggressive uh, behavior. Um, and you know, it makes me think of the thing that uh, a lot of uh, criminologists will say. Many it used to be feminist criminologists. Now, many criminologists, I think, will say that the one thing that we can do to reduce crime is to socialize little boys as if they were little girls. So people don't usually like to hear that, but the the, the uh, some of the studies on the relationship between hypermasculinity um, and music and aggressive behavior uh, also s suggest that. I, I already just mentioned that uh, the again the the um, relationship between uh, music and behavioral problems can can almost wholly be associated with uh, male uh, socialization and so and and, and hypermasculinity and and uh, hyper masculine uh, uh, cultures and their association with uh, antisocial behavior and um, the types of music that are associated with those uh, groups. I already also mentioned that there are the studies that associate different uh, subculture, subcultural groups with certain types of uh, uh, um, behaviors and uh, music. Uh, and Norman already mentioned that uh, Barry Manilow was listed on the top 10 uh, most terminally uncool <laughs> uh, uh, music uh, list of, of, of types of music. And, and uh, so uh, there, are, there is this notion in culture that there's music that's uncool. And I would argue that if, uh, uh, if we criminalized classical music, and if we started some moral entrepreneurial campaign to uh, make classical music cool and, and to criminalize uh, other types of, uh, to criminalize classical music and associate rap and punk and heavy metal with you know, people who are more elderly and, uh, I shouldn't say elderly, elderly is not uncool, but, but certain, I should say, uh, uh, I should say associate, uh, uh, how do I want to say, you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, 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 but we could, we could create a, a society where classical music is associated with hyper-masculinity and, you know, cool, cool behavior, you don't think so? But, but I would argue that a lot of this is, is about you know what we're all told um, is associated with being hip, cool, and young, and it's less about the music and and more about um, uh, all of that. Um, and and there has been, and I think Norman also uh, mentioned this too, that, that there's this belief that the music from the Baroque period is, is the music that has the most, uh, is the most effective in terms of deterring crime or repelling uh, youth. And it's, it's, it's because of the unfamiliarity of the um, tones. And so there's some uh, a aspect of, of, of that a as well. Um, so, so anyway, so, so in terms of the, the, um, the, the association of, of music and subcultural style and the ideas and culture about what music's cool and what music is, is uncool, uh, all of that plays a, a, a huge role in uh, the decisions about what types of music to use as a septed technique to deter crime. But the last thing that I want to talk about uh, around some of this is, um, well, I already mentioned some of the methodological issues, but uh, uh, the, one is the methodological issues. You know, is it effective to use music as a uh, crime prevention technique? And we do need to have more empirical studies to uh, determine to, uh, you know, what music should be used in what areas, how effective is it really uh, to use music. And it's relatively cheap to use music, just put up some speakers and 
And so it doesn't cost communities a lot to, to do that. Um, but we do need to know in terms of how effective uh, is it as a crime prevention through environmental design uh, technique. Um, the other thing that is just really interesting to think about, and it's a much larger discussion than we have time for here, but uh, a number of uh, writers have, uh, and, and researchers and scholars have uh, raised this issue of um, whether or not the use of music as a, a crime prevention through environmental design uh, technique is a misuse of music to harm. And a lot of that is related to that issue of um, using music to mark the territory of certain communities and also the, the whole idea that, that, that classical music is high culture and heavy metal is low culture and we're gonna label the, the uh, uh, music and the aesthetic and style of, of certain groups as high and low uh, culture and so um, the 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 issue of uh, whether or not it's ethical to do that has been raised by a number of, of authors and some of the uh, articles on your uh, uh, reference list uh, discuss um, some of that. Um, so I just left you with uh, uh, a couple quotes to, to think about uh, along these lines. But the the bottom line uh, with some of this is that. Um, this whole uh, idea of, of using music to, to mark territories has ethical implications uh, if we're really going to uh, um, uh, use music to mark the, the territories of, of certain communities. And it has the, the impact of um, exploiting classical music and um, uh, and and, and it, it takes us away from the larger conversation of why we're doing it, which uh, some of the issues that I've raised in terms of the relationship between pop culture and criminal behavior uh, are, are, are just one of the many issues to think about. But uh, the argument is that, that if, if we do it without thinking about it, and if we don't think about the ethical implications of using music to repel teens or other types of uh, groups from communities, that's going to take us away from some of the uh, large issues associated with uh, uh, doing that. So that's it for now. Uh, thank you. And just to piggyback on uh, what Jackie was just talking about, uh, I also, uh, in uh, preparation for my part of the talk, I wanted to find out exactly what young people uh, thought of classical music, young urban kids thought of classical music. So what I did was uh, I created a little survey and I asked the students at Suitland High School out in Forestville, Maryland, what they thought of classical music. And the responses I got uh, were actually pretty consistent. I was kind of surprised. The majority of the kids said that they liked classical music. Uh, these are high school kids at Suitland. Uh, said that they liked classical music because it was soothing and pretty. Several students said that classical music calmed their nerves. One kid said that he liked classical music because it doesn't have heavy bass like rock and roll. That thought that was really interesting. One holdout said that uh, he didn't like classical music because he thought it was boring. So you get that boring thing and then you get the soothing thing. This particular student, interesting, also said that their favorite music is oldies and R&B. They were raised on that kind of music, and their liking that kind of music cannot be changed. Hmm. Only, only one or two kids said that classical music was their favorite kind of music. So a lot of, uh, a lot of them, like us, they compartmentalize the type of music that they listen to depending on their mood. Unfortunately, only one of the kids said that they wanted to go into classical music professionally. Uh, now, all these kids were in a music class, which is unusual in this day and age, but they were. Um, and I asked them how they came to know classical music. How came they, how came them to classical music? Some of them said that their parents played it at home. Others said that they came to know and like it because of taking music classes in school. But once again, these are not your average thugs and drug dealers on the corner. These are people who were taking music in school. Um, and by the way, I'd like to uh, thank Donna Williams, our concert uh, assistant for uh, uh, 
disseminating this survey and getting them back and talking to the students for me. So uh, it's a fascinating subject and I think it warrants a further study. Um, so on that note, we'll open up the floor for questions. Do you have questions? Yes, ma'am. To, have there been studies done to explore the areas of the brain that different kinds of music uh, uh, affects, like the heavy rock and the heavy metal, would that affect one part of the brain, whereas classical music might have more of an impact or impact more areas? Do you want to come? Because I know you've had people contact. Well, from what I understand, uh, different kinds of music will affect. Uh, the brain in the sense that certain types of music, I, we talked about this when I did the dangerous music lecture, certain types of music will uh, encourage uh, uh, endorphins in the brain, which you get into that sort of uh, hypermasculinity, activity, aggression thing. And I have to assume that uh, uh, other types of music will encourage, what's the opposite, serotonin? Uh, to do the opposite effect, uh, but that's, that's my extent of that kind of knowledge. Yes. I just, uh, I, I'm sort of remembering Stanley Kubrick's film, A Clockwork Orange, where a very violent episode takes place to the tune of classical music. Mm -hmm. And I seem to remember that Stanley does this to be ironic, but it's also classical music that's being played as a way of controlling the environment. This is considerably before some of your studies. But do your studies show anything that suggests, as Mr. Kubrick seems to be, that one can overuse this technique and that it loses its, its effectiveness? I thought you were going to say something about, because there was a, a copycat crime where the rapists actually played some classical music while they were engaging in a you know, but 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 uh, uh, but uh, in terms of you know, you mean we're we're well, I think that gets to some of the ethics of, of some of the, you mean playing classical music in the communities and having it be programmed in so that we repel. Yeah, I mean, certainly I think it has that potential, and that's why you know if 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 people adopt. I mean, I, I I forgot to mention the business though about uh, you know the question of are, are we uh, displacing crime or diffusing crime, diff diffusing crime, and so you know we are moving crime a block away. Are we con really controlling criminal behavior by playing classical music? No, I mean, we need the studies that show that. If we had studies that showed that it actually did diffuse crime, that we actually did decrease the likelihood, you know, on a more widespread scale, yeah, I'm sure it would have the potential to be used um, for harm and used in a very negative um, way. So. And if you also uh, think about whether uh, if you walked into a department store that constantly played classical music over the sound system, uh, would that store have less shoplifting? We don't know, probably not. You know, so uh, you have to think about that. There is another aspect to this uh, that I'm thinking about doing in another lecture as to the sinister uses of classical music. Uh, to control behavior. That, that's a whole nother area. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. Um, has yes. yes, yes, yes. Yes, I was tempted to ask how many um, residents moved out when they began playing country music, but I won't ask that. Um, <laughs> department stores, which we mentioned briefly, have a common belief among management that the type of music that they play has an impact on the sales. Wait there, a minute, you're giving my lecture away. No, go, go, go ahead, no, no, no. There go has ahead. to be some sort of empirical studies on that subject. And I don't mean to take your lecture yes. away, but it yes. seems to me very connected, both in the morality and also in the effectiveness arguments. There have been studies done by marketing uh, entities on this. Uh, well, I'll give some of it away. Um, for instance, there have been, there's been proof that in certain liquor stores, if they want to have a sale on French wine, they will play French music. 
and it does work. And when they switch from having a sale on Italian wine, uh, French wine to Italian wine, then they switch to Vivaldi and other uh, Italian composers. And the customers understand it, they get it, and they buy more Italian wine. So yes, there is, there is that aspect. Do they play Metallica when they want to sell Bud? When they want to sell Bud? Bud? I don't know. <laughs> Yes. yes. Yes, I'd like to know, have they used uh, music in prisons, which can be very violent um, environments? You know, have they used that? As yeah, a, I was, I, I, we had did the, I think I, we did mention it the podcast earlier, but I actually, I just came from a criminology conference and I was talking to a colleague who was a warden of a prison and, and, and he said that they played classical music in, you know, one of the units and the inmates really, uh, uh, the prisoners really uh, uh, liked it. So in terms of studies of how music, they're really, I haven't seen any actual, like I said, empirical studies on its effect, but I know, um, you know, anecdotally in different prisons experience with, with experiment with, with it. So. Yes. Yes. Hello. Um, I would like to discuss with you um, the, the poll that you, said, you were talking about, about when you are in a liquor store, you put French music or Italian music, and it has a tendency to um, influence the customer. I am French myself, and I am keen in wines, but in France, when you go in a liquor store, you have absolutely no music. No French music, no Spanish, no Italian music, and people go in a liquor store to buy wine, and the music does not influence us in the taste or in the particular brand of wine we want. I would like to ask you, where did you get this uh, study made? Because this is very interesting as a French person the st to uh, understand. Uh, it was, I read it, I read it in a book. <laughs> uh, it was, um, uh, a, st uh, a, a report on this about ambient music, uh, background music, and how music is used in marketing, and uh, it's that. W that's the only reference I had. It was that uh, certain uh, stores in this country. Remember, we're talking about the United States, not France, and so marketing techniques over here uh, are radically different because of just the way the culture is 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 created or, or built. So um, that was just the, the one reference I had to that liquor store. But they did say that it worked in, in these particular stores that used the technique. They did say that. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Is there any evidence that sort of whatever you're playing, the, the music, it kind of wears off? I mean, that after a while people don't hear, what, hear it? Or, I mean, it sounds like not. It sounds like this. It goes on. I mean, my experience with it is that, you know, it, I stopped noticing it after a while, but... Well, like I said, there haven't been any studies that have looked at it. I know some communities, the law enforcement, were worried about it really annoying people and, you know, shooting out speakers and stuff like that. But, uh, um, you know, it has the potential to do that, that I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But I think in a lot of these places, uh, it hadn't, in so, many of the places, it hasn't been used for long periods of time, so... Yes, yes. Um, I was just in London a couple of weeks ago and I, in the tube, and uh, I was in London in the tube, and I did hear the classical music in, in mostly in the downtown area mm -hmm. in the tube. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't think about that it might be some sort of um, sociological control mechanism, but it was very nice. I enjoyed it. <laughs> and people seemed very calm and... Uh, and, and not upset, and there were many young people in the tube with me. Yeah. So um, uh, I, it seems to me, amongst the criminology studies uh, and the psychology studies, I'm surprised that there aren't a lot of references, and there aren't a lot of um, studies of testing low-level classical music in prisons. It, it seems like a great PhD. Why not mm -hmm. get your students involved? <laughs> What do you mean low level? What does that mean? You mean play. Low level. Oh, volume wise. To do what? To do what? To do. As a prison management tool, you mean?
That's reminded me of what the guy, uh, the person, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, let me just say, I have one, just the one thing I would say about that, and it, it would apply in prison the same as it would apply in any community, that, that the physiological, and that's why I said before, the physiological um, uh, benefits of you know, s listening to a certain type of music it would, be such a, it would be a small part of it, and I do think there are studies that show those benefits, but you start playing classical music in a maximum security prison for long periods of time and don't alter other aspects aspects of the environment in terms of prison management and the classical music alone is not going to reduce the number of prison infractions and you know without having it be part just like in the community of a whole larger um, a change in the composition of the environment so but I will say that uh, uh, we talked about this in the, the podcast the famous uh, sheriff out in Arizona uh, with the pink underwear and pink jail cells and all that kind of stuff. That, that facility also has its own radio station. And the radio station at that facility really monitors the type of music that is on its playlist. It's not all classical, but uh, it's not, there's no heavy metal and no, nothing that would uh, encourage uh, aggressive behavior. So they do do that. At, at, at that facility. But again, I would say it's more the relationship between music and the aesthetic and style of certain subcultures because many prison, prisons in Washington, they, didn't, they don't allow raiders jackets, for example, in, in the prison and certain symbols and t-shirts and, and um, you know, those types of uh, aspects of it because it, 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 the, the belief is that those artifacts are criminogenic. So, um, so, so how much of it is the physiological stuff and how much of it is the personal identity, subcultural identity stuff is a, yes. another question. Well, uh, the, the, yeah. I, the, the question of the hypermasculinity and, and, and its relationship with the music raised the thought and the question in my mind in, in other cultures, and you're sort of making an association between identity and music. In, in, in other cultures, there, is, there are the, the rhythmic musical expressions that are characterized by, you know, sort of war, war dances, and there are also there are also, I believe, other an, an sort of other rhythmic um, musics that are more more female oriented. And I was just wondering if, if there is if there is any significant. Um, I, I've always I always sort of put them all together because it's drums and 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 significant amount of atonal singing and chanting, you know, which creates the community uh, sense. But wondering whether there's a, a significant qualitative and quantitative difference between the sort of rather complex, softer, more feminine side of, of, of music as opposed to the more um, uh, aggressive, more hard rhythmic, hard rock music, which is very mm -hmm. characteristic. I mean, the, 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 that music that we're talking about is, is not, you know, it, it's, it doesn't have a lot of a variability in its beat. 4-4 four, four rhythm is, is characteristic of it. So I was just wondering if you, do, do you know if there's any relationship? Are, are you at the, the, I'm, the, I'm asking the, either the, one. I don't know. Well, you know, I think there is, I mean, the studies that have shown the preference with these certain subcultures, that the, the preference has the uh, antisocial subcultures, and there's all sorts of research on the relationship between masculinity and antisocial behavior and antisocial personality disorder and, and uh, uh, masculine cultural values and all of that. And, 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 and so it's very interesting, you know, raising that. And, and, and it would actually, I'm thinking as you were talking, it would be fascinating to uh, implement that, you know, uh, do a study of that to look at the types of music that women have a preference for and, and play that music in, in the communities. But uh, the the in terms of um, I mean th yes there there is that that preference between you know the masculine antisocial subcultures and certain types of um, music so I don't know if that's answering your the, Uh, 
L7, <laughs> there's all sorts of old, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there, I mean, I, I don't know that there's studies uh, on it, but uh, there's a whole area in criminology on the, you know, the rise of the new violent female and in, in, in the early 90s and the pop aspects of pop culture in terms of film and, and music that were associated with increased level of female ag ag aggression, but it's really an interesting question to think about. Uh, We've got to stop. I got to get you guys back downstairs. Uh, please thank Dr. Helfcott again. Before, bef before you guys walk out, uh, just, uh, just a, uh, an announcement. Uh, the Depression and Creativity Symposium uh, with Dr. K. Jamison is, uh, is now on the library's website. Uh, just go on the library's website, loc.gov, uh, click under webcast, and then under that, click under culture, and you will get uh, Dr. Jamison's uh, uh, symposium. Thank you very much. Uh, our next Music in the Brain is on March 27th. I'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.